In a previous video, we interfered with an election taking place at the Republic of Dave. If, through our machinations, we ousted the sitting president, Dave, he flees his own republic and walks off into the wastes. But where does he go? Well, we can follow his trail slightly southwest of the Republic of Dave. We eventually reach a road that we can follow for some time, which ends at an intersection. This intersection is a hotspot for random encounters. In my game, I found two escaped slaves here. I was able to free them using my science skill to disarm their explosive slave collars. On the opposite side of this intersection, we find an old ruined Red Rocket truck stop. Inside is another hotspot for a random encounter. In my game, I found a scavenger scavenging from a downed Protectron. He warned me to walk away before he opened fire. So heading back out and continuing down the road, we see bottles of soda spilling out of a delivery truck. Hopping on in, we see a lot of empty bottles, but we also find many completely full bottles of Nuka-Cola. If we go through each of these crates, we will walk away with six Nuka-Cola Quantums and over 30 bottles of Nuka-Cola. This is an important find if we are doing the Nuka-Cola challenge for Sierra Petrovita at the bottling plant. After looting the Nuka-Cola, we can turn around to go north along the road. Here we pass by a ruined overpass, and we get attacked by mire lurks from a nearby pond. After killing the mire lurks so we can explore the pond, it's not very interesting. We find a lot of mire lurk eggs and that's about it. So continuing on our way, we see a ruined city loom before us and in the ruins, we spy a death claw. Where? There's more where that came from. These are the ruins of Old Olney. In our world, Olney is only 20 miles north of Washington, D.C. It used to be an agricultural area, but has grown into a residential area. Based on the ruins we find in the Fallout universe, however, it looks like a major downtown area filled with shops and businesses. The real world only is only 10 or so miles away from Rockville, which is where Bethesda has its headquarters. But the only we find in Fallout 3 is not only completely ruined, but infested. We find death claws near around every corner. What is it about only that attracts so many death claws? They use these ruins almost like a nest. Inside the ruins, we find a lot of corpses, sometimes mercenaries, sometimes settlers. I'm sure some of these people have wandered into Olney, where they met their demise, but I doubt so many people would, knowing its reputation, which makes me think that the death claws may drag their prey back here. I get the impression that death claws like to inhabit what appear to them to be fortified, enclosed spaces. We see that settlers or wastelanders had at one time tried to fortify the ruins of Olney. Many of these streets are blocked off with big plywood barricades. And this may have been what attracted the Death Claws here to begin with. In Fallout New Vegas, we know that Death Claws moved into Quarry Junction. There's only one way in or out of the quarry, and lots of nooks and crannies for the Death Claws to nest. As we explore, we stumble upon the body of Dave. It looks like Dave, the brilliant leader, decided to refound his republic here in Old Olney. But it looks like the Death Claws didn't want to become his subjects. He lies dead on the ground next to a pile of other bodies. Raiders. Wastelanders. There are piles of gore and viscera and lots of containers. Ammo boxes, first aid boxes, and there's even another one hidden behind one of these dumpsters next to a skeleton. Here we find a combat shotgun and a lot of shotgun shells in the box. Despite the danger, it's rewarding to clear this place. Almost every single one of these bodies we find was carrying a mid to high level weapon. I walked away with two or three laser rifles and four or five laser pistols that I could use to repair my unique ones. On the southeastern side of the town, we find a unique ruined building. This almost looks like a fire station with four big garage doors. Heading on up to the door, we find a really old skeleton crumbled up, and it was hard to see, possibly because of the lighting or the textures, but there is, in fact, a note resting on the step. Nuka-Cola Accident Report. Taking a look at it in our Pip-Boy, 
I was driving on the highway east of Old Olney near the gas station and suddenly a deer ran out in front of my rig. I swerved to avoid hitting it, but my brakes locked up and I ended up jackknifed against the guardrail. I was in the process of delivering a very important shipment to the Old Olney grocery, so I have called and requested an immediate pickup in front of Old Olney's firehouse. I will wait there until the tow truck arrives. There has been some breakage, but the special shipment is still intact. I'm not injured, but the truck is likely a total loss. This is my first incident of this nature with the company, and I hope it will not reflect poorly on my future evaluations. Carl Wallace, Nuka Cola Corporation Driver 09899, Department SH03. Well, this paints a tragic picture. On the morning of October 23rd, 2077, this poor man, a driver for Nuka Cola, was making a delivery of Nuka Cola Quantums to a local grocery store. We know that this was his special delivery because Nuka Cola Quantum was released the very day the bombs dropped. After his accident, he came here to sit in front of the fire department. The bombs dropped, and the radiation likely instantly killed him. But this lines up well with what we already know about Fallout lore. I had one viewer leave a comment on a video I published recently about who really dropped the bombs, and he wondered how we could find Nuka-Cola Quantum all over the world if it was released the very day the bombs dropped. And I believe that this guy Carl, and men like him, are part of the answer. The Nuka-Cola company had likely produced their Nuka-Cola Quantum weeks before and had been shipping it to stores to await the release day. They had likely shipped boxes earlier in the week and were continuing to make deliveries even on Saturday, the day of the big launch. While most drivers had successfully made their deliveries, which is why we find Quantum in many ruined stores around the Capital Wastelands and the Commonwealth, this poor guy Carl wrecked his truck, which is why we find his truck still filled with Nuka-Cola Quantum. As we explore, we find another pile of bodies and gore and viscera, this time around the entrance to a sewer. This has me curious. Yes, we will explore this, but first let's make sure we've completely explored the ruins. While exploring, it got dark. The city is still powered with electricity. Every street lamp glows. And as we walk towards the northern side of the town... Blah! What was that? We walked over a grate, but it wasn't secure. We fell down into this hole, and there's no way up. Did we just fall into a trap? But on the opposite side of this tiny little box, we find a door to the only sewers. Heading inside, we face a wall. We can go right or left. Going right first, we see that this is blocked off with a big grate. So turning around and going left. Now this guy surprised me and... Now I need to be careful. Looks like there will be death claws here. This little tunnel ends at a door, and opening the door, we find ourselves in some sort of maintenance room. There's a crate of dirty water on the floor by the door, and then a terminal against the eastern wall. Automated maintenance terminal, locked with an average lock. After hacking it, we find an option to run the nearby maintenance routine for the attached Protectron. But as soon as we run it, a death claw charges into the room. <laughs> RS3 B4.1.6 Utility Helper Receiving Sewer Maintenance Routine Please Hold Link Terminated Critter of Unusual Size Detected Running Program Extermination Authorized Personnel Only Please present a valid ID. Uh, all right, is this thing gonna attack me? Maybe we can find some identification in this room. Ah, yes, by the skeleton. On the ground, we find a utility worker ID. With it in hand, we can approach the Protectron. Scan accepted. Move along. With that, he takes our worker ID and he doesn't attack. Everybody wins. Well, while this guy goes off to kill some critters of unusual size, we can continue exploring. Aside from the numerous containers with randomized loot, we find an ammo box beneath a table and a stash of darts on a nearby shelf with a first aid kit. On the opposite side of the exit door, we find two more ammo boxes on a shelf. Heading out the door, we see that the Protectron has gotten far ahead of us. To the right, we find a ladder. This leads to the old only underground, but it requires a key. 
This is locked because it's part of an important quest that we get when doing the Broken Steel DLC for Fallout 3. The only underground is sprawling and fascinating, but we need to save this until we do our series on Broken Steel. So instead, let's continue exploring the rest of the sewers. There's a dead end to the left, so turning around, we can go down this hill. We see the ruined Protectron on the ground, and that must mean... And then his buddy comes! At the end, we find another junction. We'll start by exploring to the left. Here we see a path off to the right, which is blocked off with a gate. So going back leads us to a darkened room, which appears to have no enemies. So turning on our light, we can continue exploring where we find a safe in one of the counters. After picking the lock, we find a small amount of loot and a door against the northern wall. But this is locked with a very hard lock. We need a skill of 100 to pick it. So changing into some overalls and taking some mentats to increase my intelligence, we raise our lock picking skill just enough to pick the lock. Inside, we find Quite a haul indeed. Two mini nukes at the bottom of a shelf, two first aid kits, and then three more mini nukes at the very top of the shelf. Aside from that, we can loot a number of ammo boxes and gun cabinets, but this is a dead end. So turning around and heading back the way we came, we can go down the western path, which turns south. Here we find a death claw to the right. This is just another gated off dead end. And so heading down the southern tunnel, we see a ladder to the left, that must be the way out. We'll keep that in mind as we continue exploring south. Opening the door leads to a big room with an eastern door leading to another hallway. Down the hallway, we see a door to the right, but peering through, that kind of looks like the way we need to go. So instead, I'm gonna go forward and continue down the hallway until we find a room with a death claw. In this room, we see mattresses all over the ground, bunk beds. There's a lot of gore all over and red splatters of blood. Looks like whatever happened here happened recently. At the end of this room, we find a fat man on the ground. Well, this will go well with the four mini nukes we picked up earlier. And right above it, we see three average locked wall safes. One with randomized loot, another with randomized loot, and the third one with, you guessed it, quite a lot of randomized loot. Right next to this on a bunk bed is a missile launcher with an ammo crate containing missiles and a Nuka-Cola Quantum sitting on the ground right next to it. Who could have possibly been camped out here with all of these high-powered weapons? Retracing our steps, we can now go through that door we opened earlier, and here we find a grisly scene. On the ground are four fresh corpses, surrounded by older skeletons, and there's a big hole in the nearby concrete tunnel. We see a wastelander, a mercenary, and the corpse of a Brotherhood of Steel initiate. On his body is a medic power armor manual and the unique item, prototype medic power armor. Ignore the pulse rifle, this is part of a mod, not part of the vanilla game. The note reads, MP-47A, Medic Power Armor. Security clearance G required to read this manual. Currently in prototype, the Medic Power Armor, referred to as Medic Armor Hereafter, is designed to protect the soldier in the field and serve as an automated medic. The prototype unit only has medics delivery systems. The production unit will include stim packs and other injectables. User requirements for medic armor stated that even a child should be able to use it without reading the manual. Therefore, an onboard computer system with verbal feedback response systems has been installed. The soldier in the field puts on the armor, and the armor does the rest. It automatically senses the limb condition of the soldier and applies medics only if needed. If the defense contract is extended, the onboard computer system will be enhanced to provide command level data to field officers. A special self-destruct will deliver a lethal injection to deserters. Until the contract is extended, these systems remain offline. Well, that's good news. I'd hate to think I'm putting on a piece of armor that could inject me with poison. When we find it, it's at about 80% condition or so. And when we put it on, Listen up, you goddamn puke! You are now wearing prototype medic power armor! You take care of me, and I'll take care of you! Ah, ha ha! Oh, this is gonna be fun! I can't wait to see what this guy says out in the field. This corpse of the Brotherhood outcast on the floor is not part of the game. I believe this was added by a mod I have installed. It's an energy special effects mod. I'm not sure why they would add so many unique weapons and new corpses to the game, but anyway, this body is not part of the vanilla experience. 
After looting the power armor, we can head through the big broken wall, which leads to a cave tunnel. At the end of the cave tunnel, we find a copy of Duck and Cover beneath a skeleton holding a wooden spoon. He's face down before a bunch of rocks blocking his path. Let's see, what exactly was going on here? Well, I think we can assume that the Brotherhood Initiate, the Wastelander, and the Mercenary were likely the ones who had been camping out in that one room with the bunk beds. That would explain the high-level weapons we find there, a Fat Man and a Missile Launcher. The Brotherhood, of course, are known for using such high-powered weapons. Maybe the Brotherhood was on a rescue mission. Perhaps they got word that the Wastelander and the Mercenary were trapped down here. Or perhaps the Brotherhood chose to hire a Mercenary to help on this rescue mission. The Brotherhood has worked with mercenaries in the past that wouldn't be new to them. What I think may have happened is after they entered the sewers to try and find the Wastelander, the Death Claws followed them in, so they couldn't leave the way they came in, forcing them to make a way out. And so they fled down this path trying to find a way out, only to discover that this hole in the wall led to a dead end. Here the Death Claws trapped them and slaughtered them. What I can't explain is why a Brotherhood of Steel initiate would be wearing a piece of pre-war prototype technology. You'd think the Brotherhood would be very guarded about this, keep it under lock and key. And if they did use it, it would be used by someone higher up, not a Brotherhood initiate. But now we have to explain how this hole got in the wall to begin with. We see a couple of dead skeletons on the ground near the Brotherhood of Steel initiate and the other two corpses, and then that one skeleton at the end of the tunnel with the wooden spoon in his hand. Those bodies have long since decomposed to become skeletons, which tells us that whatever they were doing happened a long time, possibly decades or even hundreds of years before the Brotherhood of Steel initiate, the Wastelander, and the Mercenary showed up. Maybe what we see is a small snapshot of what happened just after the bombs dropped. Perhaps these were sewer workers down here. The bombs dropped. There was a big cave-in, most of these tunnels collapsed, and so they knocked down a wall and grabbed a big wooden spoon to dig their way out. But the big question this raises is why they didn't just go up that ladder out the manhole. Perhaps 200 years ago it was blocked, maybe by a truck or something. At any rate, heading up the ladder ourselves, we go out that sewer grate that we saw earlier. The Medic Power Armor is a pretty decent suit of power armor. It's a modified suit of T-45 power armor. It looks almost identical to a suit of T-45. It has a DR of 40, grants 25% radiation resistance at the cost of one agility, weighs 45 pounds, and can be repaired with other suits of T-45. Even though the manual says that this is a prototype and that they did plan on other versions that can automatically inject stim packs, we don't find any other versions of the medic power armor in the game. So unlike the stealth suit from Old World Blues and Fallout New Vegas, this medic power armor only administers medics and nothing else. But like the stealth suit from Old World Blues, it talks to us. If it detects nearby enemies, it has something to say, and in battle, it'll automatically administer medics to us if it detects that we need it. Gear up, soldier! Be a soldier, not a simmy. Have some juice and suck it up. Pansy, take a shot of vitamin M and keep fighting. It does require some medics in our inventory to work. However, the nice thing about the suit is we don't suffer the negative consequences of using medics. We can't get addicted. And that is the full story of Old Only and the prototype medic power armor from Fallout 3. Never fear, we will explore the old only underground when I do my series on Broken Steel. What are your thoughts on that scene at the very end of the sewers? How do you explain the Initiate even being there in the company of the Wastelander and the Mercenary? How do you interpret the skeleton with the wooden spoon in his hand? Was he really trying to dig his way out? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I have a new shirt in the shop, folks. Sunset Sarsaparilla. Build mass with sass. It has an image of everyone's favorite muscle man lifting weights and drinking Sunset Sarsaparilla on the front. And on the back, we have Festus pointing at a bottle of the beverage with a big old list of some silly old advisories. You can find a link to the shirt in the description below, or you can click here. 
Thanks for watching, folks. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. I take Sundays off, so I'm not going to have a video for you on Monday, but never fear, we will be back with our regularly scheduled programming come Tuesday morning. If you like what I do here and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you bright and early Tuesday morning with a brand new video. I've got nothing to say to you. Best move on. I've got nothing to say to you. Best move on.